chapter 9, verse 33 in your scripture. Mark 9, 33. Now it's on. Hey, surprise, surprise, that was my fault. <laughs> Shocking. Well, let's pick up in the life of our heroes. They have been to the Mount of Transfiguration. They have had an amazing opportunity to see God heal uh, a child and now they are, are leaving that area and they're going home. Jesus has moved from Nazareth. Now he lives on the northern seashore in a, a town called Capernaum. Okay, so we move to verse 33 and it says, And they came to uh, Capernaum. This is the city proper, if you will, of uh, Capernaum. Uh, I thank the Lord for drones. Um, I had someone take this picture, and man, it gives a really good, good indication of, of what the city looked like. I'm going to point out a few, few things here. This area right here, okay, that is the very synagogue that Jesus Christ taught in during his lifetime. There are very few places on the planet that you can go to where you can actually stand where you know Jesus stood. One of my favorite pictures of my family is us sitting on the southern steps of the, sea, uh, of the city of David. And we know that Jesus was on those exact steps 2,000 years ago. And uh, that is just just to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, the uh, master of the universe stood there is amazing to me. Another one of those such places is this area here. Now this has been, there is some reconstruction that has gone uh, on inside the, the synagogue, but there are some of the original stones uh, that are still there and they're, they're kind of worn because that's the spot to get your picture taken. And uh, folks really love that. Um, over here, some general houses and things like that. These are houses. Uh, that is Church of something. Entro, keys, one, two, three. Just so y'all know, I don't think that was my mistake. <laughs> yeah, something happened that I didn't do. When the whole tech booth does this, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What that is. Isn't that the, um, where Jesus, uh, the, the uh, church of walking on water or something? I forget. Shanova? Don? Can't remember? Okay. Well, it's a Catholic church. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Over here would be where Jesus preached to the, um, the thousands of people. It's really cool, this area over here. This structure here is a really cool church built on top of a house like this. See all these other little houses? Well, this little bitty house right there, uh, when we read the rest of the verse here, um, and when he was in the house, uh, not a house, it's interesting. Um, you're going to uh, see later on, he'll say a child and then the child and stuff like that. When he says the house in Capernaum, he's talking about the specific house. This would have been the house that Peter lived in. Okay? So this is Peter's house, and, and they have excavated this and discovered that this is where uh, uh, Peter lived. They found a little note as a diary in there. And remember, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. There's a little diary in there saying the day that Jesus did what I didn't want him to do. Um, 
That's a joke. It's a joke, okay? He healed his mother-in-law. <laughs> I get it's a mother-in-law. She was sick, nearly dead, and Jesus helped her. Peter's like, Arr. Anyway, um, and my mom's here. My mother-in-law's here. Good to see you, Nanny Da. Glad you're here. And I'm glad Jesus has healed you. I have no such doubt. I'm going to move on. <laughs> That's amazing for me to be able to just move on. Okay, so this underneath this really, really amazing church is um, the house that Jesus Christ is in there. He asked them inside the house, what are you arguing about on the, on the way? But they were silent. Why? Because on the way, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Don't read any more into this than what it actually is. These are full-grown men who had just seen the transfiguration. They had just heard that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom, and now they're trying to figure out who it's going to be. Peter, James, and John, of course, they think they're going to be the greatest. Amen. They were with Jesus at the transfiguration. So we're going to be the greatest. The others are like, no, it, it won't be y'all. While y'all were up there sleeping and taking a nap, we were down here, down here healing people and casting out demons. We were the ones doing the work. We're going to be the greatest. I can only imagine how these full-grown men conversation uh, went on. And Jesus, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus understood uh, what was going on uh, in them. Okay. Oh, I forgot to show you the inside of Peter's house. There it is. Okay. Not much. Okay, so they're arguing about it. Monitors are not keeping up with me for some reason. Okay, and uh, sitting, and, and, and oh yeah, I wanted to say this too. Um, here we are 2,000 years later and nothing has changed. Not a thing. I was introduced once as Bishop Wright Reverend Dr. Ricky Ray. BA, comma, MDiv, comma, THD, comma, PhD. And I was like, whoa, that is a mouthful. And everyone applauded the degrees. Afterward, I was, I was talking with the person. I said, why in the world did you introduce me with all of those things? And it says, oh, oh, it's very important to have, have um, no initials after your name. Very important. And all the stuff before means something in the church. You have acquired the highest level of honor in the church. And I said, oh, how far have we come that initials after your name and titles before your name means that you finally arrived. Well, it's not just that culture. Believe me, it's this culture too. If you don't believe me, just go to a convention with preachers and you will, you will hear this all the time. Numbers and no, uh, noses and money. How many people count the noses how much money and buildings? How big is your church? And I'll tell them, oh, about 5,000 square feet, <laughs> which is exactly what it is, by the way. But we, we run around 5,000, give or take, square feet. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huge. My, my other favorite one is, how big is your church? We're doing the best we can to get smaller. Everybody there is on a diet. I have discovered that I'm just, just the whole numbers and things, just, just be done with it. Just be done with it because it, it only leads to, to more and more. Do you know that in order to speak at our convention, you have to pastor a, a huge church? Do you believe that there are pastors of churches that are smaller that, that, that have a message to share? You need to be on the committee because it's only the guys that are the, the personalities. It has not changed. It has not changed. Hey, and it's not just in church life. It's in your life too. You fight the same thing in your life. I am now a government employee. 
which means I have a lot of times to sit around and think. Okay? I work for the Census Bureau, which means that I count people because people count. Okay? And if I come to your door, I'll have my mask on, my badge, and I'll have my Census 2020 uh, uh, bag, and I'll show it to you. And you'll go, oh, man. Mom, the IRS guy's here every time. <laughs> and I'll go up there, and then I'll talk to the people in, about how many people are there, and I get all kinds of different reactions, especially when I get to the part about race. What race are you? It, today, more than ever, what is the greatest race? Which race really matters? The Indy 500 is the greatest race. I think it's the Daytona, but that's between, you know, the human race. I need to stop pausing. <laughs> there's, a, there's a thing called a, a pause for dramatic effect. It's, it's whenever I pause. Now, if I go, hey, what did I, that, that's a question time. And there's no time at all where heckling <laughs> is encouraged, okay? <laughs> Our bouncers are ready for the heckling section today. My mother was like, who's that heckling you? I'll come up there and take care of that. I said, no, you won't, Mama. You ain't seen Leonard. <laughs> if you weren't here last Sunday, that, that was, I was heckled by everybody. I'm just picking on one particular person. And also last Sunday, I said that eventually I would preach on Kathy Kinsey's sin. I just didn't know it would be this Sunday. Who among you is the greatest? The next verse, verse 35, says, Sitting down, he called the twelve. I like that. Um, just for fun, you ought to do a story. Of, oh, thank you for not speaking while I pause there. Just for fun, you ought to do a story on when Jesus sits down. Because it's really cool. He sits down for three things, just real briefly, to eat, amen, okay, to teach, and to wait. He's sitting down now beside the Father, waiting. I love that passage. He's sitting down to teach, and he called the twelve. The twelve should be capitalized in your, your Bible. He's talking about the disciples. And he said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the last and servant of all. And he took a child and had him stand among them. He took a child, a little bitty child, and had him stand there among him. I'm just going to wait till she looks up here. This is our child. Her name's Kara. And we're playing football. And this is the huddle. <laughs> and it may look like Uncle Tony is telling her what to do, but that ain't happening. <laughs> Kara has got it going on. And we're about to run a play called Hand It to Kara and Knock Down Anybody That Tries to Touch Her. That was the play. And Kara's like, I don't know, I just kind of wanted to share that picture. And I've been looking for something. She went to Liberty. We dropped her off yesterday, drove away. That's why I'm wearing my Liberty uh, shirt. Boy, she has grown, hasn't she? Man, that's back in the day. She still got the hand on the hip, still living like that. He took a child and had him stand among them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. Oh, my goodness. What an amazing passage this is. He, he takes this little child. Hey, really cool, Peter's, Peter's boy. Where did he get the child? Well, he's in Peter's house. Hey, come here. Stand right there. I'm going to teach you daddy something. Okay. About time. So Peter's boy stands there in front of him. 
And Jesus gives the, the greatest illustration of what it means to be a child, I mean to be a leader. Interesting, we miss a little bit here because in, uh, in our Bible it says child, and that's a good translation, but Jesus most definitely spoke Aramaic at this time, and he would have used a word for child that literally means servant. Child and servant were the same exact word in the languages of Jesus that he spoke. So he said, go get the servant. Go get the child. You see, because Jesus had just come in from a long journey. What is it that the servant does whenever the people come in from a journey? They wash the feet. Go get the servant. Go get the child. And if you will just hang on to this, I think I'll be finished with the message and, and um, we can go home with this understanding that what he was showing them they didn't get on this first day but pretty soon they're going to see it worked out. You see, because pretty soon he's going to use the same exact language. And on that day, he's going to do something a little different. We call it the Lord's Supper. It was the day that Jesus Christ came into another home and nobody washed his feet. Peter's son was not there. The only people that were there were the 12 disciples with a capital T, the important ones. It's capitalized in your Bible, isn't it? Because the 12 are important. They're so important that at the Lord's Supper, just, just days later, Jesus washed their feet because nobody had humbled themselves to wash the others. They were still battling with who's the greatest. And in this point, in this, at this moment in their life, he's saying, guys, you need to understand that, that the greatest ones are the ones that receive the least ones the ones that acknowledge the servants, the ones that know the servants, and they know their position. Now check it out. If you want to be greatest, be like the servant. Be like the child. They said, no, we're not going to. That's in effect what they said because when they had the opportunity to do it, they didn't. And so Jesus said, I'm going to show you an example of the king of kings. He literally took off his robe and took off his tunic. In other words, he was in his underwear, his undergarments, and he got down on his knees to wash their feet. He could have done it with his, with his outer garment on. He could have done it with his tunic on. He literally was living Philippians chapter 2 where Paul says that, he, that he, he unrobed or derobed himself of everything that he was so that he could show us, so that he could be here. And here he's doing it again, symbolically taking off his outer garment, symbolically taking off the tunic, getting down in just his inner garment to serve. And who are these little ones? Who, who, who are the ones that we're to receive? Is, is, it, is he talking about just the children? No, he's talking about that you and I must come to him as children. And in so doing, the church welcomes everyone that is a child of God. And because of that, then we can welcome the church. And we can become the church child is equal to the servant. The servant was at the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper gave us the foot washing. Foot washing showed us that the servant 
was the greatest. The greatest was the child. The child was a servant. The servant was at the foot at the Lord's Supper, who gave us the foot washing that showed us that the greatest was the servant. And the logic that Jesus speaks here, whoever welcomes one little child such as, as this in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. The logic is clear. It is the least of us where Jesus is. And if we're going to be the church, it's about being the servant of each and every one of us. It's about each one of us putting on and putting ahead the other one. The guys didn't get it. Stupid guys. Stupid, stupid, stupid guys. Amen? Just couldn't get it. They, even days later, months later, they still didn't get it because the, then they had the opportunity. Oh, I know the answer to this. I'll wash your feet. No. They jostled for position at the table to see who the one that would sit uh, closest to Christ instead of seeing who could serve the church. Well, I don't expect you to get it. As a matter of fact, I honestly said, Rick, why are you even preaching this sermon? Literally said those words. If the disciples didn't get it, what makes me think that y'all are going to get it? And my answer was, I'm going to preach it because that's what's next. That's what's next. Equality among the church is what's next. Equality. Now, guys, we need that more than we've ever needed anything in this world. Is we need to know that in this church, in this church, every single person matters. I've had the privilege of being in hundreds of churches. And one thing that I've seen over and over again is that there's usually a ruling family or a ruling patriarch or matriarch. And what they say matters and what they say goes. And if you're not part of that tree or that circle, then you're useless. And I can tell you this, God doesn't work there. Somebody say that. God doesn't work there. Amen? God works where everyone has an opinion and input. When we're all part of the church. When we all feel that we're part of the church. Now, here's how I've tried to live that out. We don't vote, okay? Uh, God calls the church his, his family. That's his favorite thing to say about the family. And in my family, we don't vote on anything, okay? We don't. We don't vote to see who gets to pray. We throw our thumbs up. And the last one to do that, they pray, okay? If you forgot to pray, then you're, you have to pray this time. Okay, if you've got to throw your thumbs up, okay, or if we can trick you when you're carrying your stuff, whatever it takes, that's how we run the family. We don't sit around the house and vote, and, and it's kind of funny because, oh, well, the, you're the husband, then, then you make all the decisions. No, we would eat Mexican three days, three times a day if I made all the decisions, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Lots of people eat Mexican every meal. Okay, there are some people who only eat American once a week. They're called Mexicans. Okay, I don't get, I, we just are a family and we work it out. And that's how our church does it too. Amen? Everybody in agreement? Nobody will even raise their hand except for you. That's, see, because you don't know. This means voting and we don't vote. <laughs> Amen. Good job, the rest of y'all. Way to go. I ain't voting for nothing. <laughs> this this passage more than anything else teaches me that that they it's something that they had to keep on being hammered at over and over and over again because natural tendency is that is to try to be the greatest and supernatural tendency is try to be the servant closing illustration and hope you get it
let's pretend that you think I'm the greatest Christian in my family. We're pretending. If I can't find Shinova, do you know what I do? In my mind, I think the rapture has happened. And I got left. Every single time. And you know why that is? Because of, of the two of us, she's the greatest servant between the two of us. And I couldn't have asked for a better illustration than last night. At 20 minutes after one, our dog whined, wanting to go outside, and woke me up. Didn't wake her up. I had to nudge her and shake her. <laughs> and she goes, what, 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 what? And I said, rascal needs to go outside. And she goes, oh, okay. She got up and she carried Rascal outside. It's because on Saturday nights, I, I, I sleep as much as possible. I don't want to be disturbed on Sunday night, uh, Saturday nights. I, I, uh, that's the night when the kids were little and they'd cry. That's the night I always got to buy. And because it's Saturday night, let him sleep. When she got finished with the dog, letting him out, she didn't come upstairs. She knew that if she came upstairs, Two things would happen. First, she'd have to climb the stairs. Second, she'd wake me up. And so she let me sleep. Of the two of us, when we get to heaven, I hope that I can see her. That's my goal. She is a servant like no one knows. I've, I've often wanted her to teach because, my goodness gracious, you should hear the things that she tells me to do. She's an amazing teacher. That's not what God's called her to do. She's been called to be a teacher. Jesus held a, a child and said, be like this child. Paul said, imitate me. I say, if you want to know how to be the greatest, Live your life like Shinova. Father, I thank you for everything that you have ever done in our lives. Most of all, most of all, I thank you that you did not get mad at these guys. But you took their question and you just dealt with where they were. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that so many times I'm afraid to come to you and tell you what I've done because I'm afraid of how you'll look at me. And, and here you have the 12, the 12, capital T, the 12, and they're standing there arguing and you just told them about your kingdom and everything. And, and instead of yelling at them, instead of embarrassing them, you sat down and you just talked to them. There are people right here, God, that they're going through the same exact emotions that those disciples are going through. And they want to serve you. They want to be the greatest. They really do. They want to, to, to know and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But just like the disciples, they're silent. Unable to actually voice their situation because they're embarrassed God I pray right now I pray that you will let your people see how you deal with people that mess up when your people mess up you just sit down with them and you love on them Teach them, you train them, you show them. God, please help us to see that, help us to know that. And during this time, Lord, when we're going to have a time of invitation, a time of response to the message, I, I pray, God, that each person will hear this question What have you been talking about? What is it that's so embarrassing you right now? What is it that's keeping you from me right now that you and I need to talk about? You've talked about it to other people. What do we need to talk about? 
and that they would find a safe place in the house. We love you, Lord. And we pray that you move in our midst today, God. I'd like to take a moment and thank those who have already given online or through the app and remind you that you can do the same. We're going to continue to take up the tithes and offerings by using the buckets on your way out, so please feel free to do so. And I just got to. Speaking of humility, I, it's my favorite joke. It's a side note. I'm adding this in. This is not the offering call. But it's definitely my humility that makes me better than all of you people. <laughs> You just can't pass that kind of stuff up. It's too good. <laughs> Anywho, on to the actual offering. <laughs> oh. Life is good. I say that a lot, and at work it gets me some funny looks, mostly because I'm at Lowe's and we sell like LG appliances, and so one guy is convinced that I'm just their spokesman. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not. I swear I thought of that on my own, or maybe I just hang around the appliances. I don't know. But it's just something I've been saying a lot, because when people ask you how you're doing, well, maybe today I'm not doing so great. But life, life is good in general, as a whole. I think if you take it all together, life is good today. Yeah. <laughs> today can be great or bad, but life is good. And I think that's because... We have a hope. And even when today is not good, life is because He is good. And so as we prepare to, to leave for the day, I just, I just want to send you out in your week and let, remind you that life is good because He is good. Dear God, remind us to be servants. Help us to follow you. Help us to love you. God, we love you. And we praise you. Anyway, a few announcements this morning. First, I'd like to welcome anybody new, a newcomer here today. It's good to have you here. Uh, you should be on a connection card. If you go ahead and fill it out at the end of service, we'll meet you in the back. I'd like to get to know you and uh, give you a free teacher. See how we can minister to you and your families. We have a baby shower today at 2 o'clock for Morgan and Jonathan Carpenter and Think Pink they're registered at Target and Amazon and that's here at the church and then next week we'll have a potluck Sunday right after the service is there a sign up or anything we just kind of trust them to bring over the bring her. Kathy Kinsey's in charge alright Kathy's in charge <laughs> <laughs> There's no sign up, just we'll surprise each other and have a good time. We'll have 10 million dishes. Everybody's going to bring drinks. It's always neat to see a really good sermon undone by one joke. Right? Hold on, I have a little cherry on the There's different views on that. Whenever I think of pride and think of. Uh, Who's the greatest? I always think of Peter, because he seemed to be one of those guys that had a lot of confidence, a lot of brashness, a lot of boldness, a lot of masculinity. He was a man's man. <clears throat> I take his words very seriously in 1 Peter. He says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under his mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. So I think that's, that's his attitude that he came through with his life, as Christ worked on him and worked with him. And I always think humility is not something you achieve, it's something you fight for all the time. Because it's not just men, it's not just women, it's not just this. Everybody wants to build themselves up. It's part of our makeup. So let's pray. <clears throat> Dismiss service. Father, I thank you for the reminder, Lord, that uh, we definitely are not the greatest. As we look around, there are great people everywhere. And we see you, Lord, and you see your greatness and your power. And Father, every good thing we do comes from you, comes from your working in us. And so you get the glory, you get the praise, and we realize who we truly are, Father. We are not deservant of your grace and your love and your mercy. 
But through your grace, through your perfect plan and your perfect ways, Lord God, that's what gives us importance. Not because of our, our own thoughts of ourselves, but your thoughts of us. So thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for giving us the identity, the greatness that comes through Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us and guide us in this week ahead, Father, and I pray that you will be glorified in our lives as we live to be servants and to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.